Today I'll be sharing with you how we planned and undertook the Landscape Scale Habitat Creation Project under the Koala Connections Project and the lessons we learnt along the way. So planning for the project began at the landscape scale and it continued through to the design of a planting on an individual property. At the landscape scale, properties were selected on the eastern side of the motorway and this was based on studies undertaken on the Tweed and Byron coast for preparation of koala plans of management. On the western side of the motorway, in the absence of koala studies, we used map koala habitat, fauna and vegetation corridors and koala records to select um, properties. And the aims in our property selection were to determine the best options to improve connectivity between koala populations or areas of habitat, to create new areas of habitat next to existing habitat and hence increase carrying capacity for koalas, and to reduce the threats to koalas, uh, koala habitat, sorry. As a first step, 600 landholders in Tweed and 400 in Byron project areas were contacted and asked if they were interested in the project. In response, we had 155 landholders in Tweed and 66 in Byron respond positively. These properties were then prioritised based on a number of criteria, including, of course, the landholder interest, the location of the property in the landscape, for example, its strategic importance in a corridor or proximity to areas of koala habitat, if the property was part of a cluster of properties also interested in participating, the percentage of map koala habitat on the property, and also the size of the property and what opportunities existed for planting. So once we shortlisted properties, we then started planning for on-ground works. So property planning was primarily guided by five key factors. Number one, so what did the landholder want for their property? Some only wanted a line of trees along a fence, others couldn't get enough trees. Two, what about the koala? What, what, what about the koala and the outcome from the koala's perspective? By going to the landholder with a proposal to link and extend areas of koala habitat, we could combine this with the landholder's vision. Three, how much money could we spend on each property? Sites, we categorised sites as level one, two and three sites. Each level had a corresponding budget range, so funds could be allocated to enough properties. This ensured uh, landholders with smaller properties were actually not excluded. I mean, to the koala, a few trees in a paddock might be just as important as a paddock full of trees. Four, what were the physical conditions of the property? We needed to consider things like access and topography, the type and density of weeds, hydrology and soils, presence of stock, bushfire risk, and how much space was there actually available to plant on the property. And five, what was the landholder's capacity and commitment to maintain works in the longer term? The final component of our planning involved planting design. We, we sort of set, set to, um, stuck to standard methods, but we balanced a range of factors to meet our project targets, but also to try and get the best overall outcome for the property. So cost had a big bearing on planting configuration. If you had a, a square fence planting, this was cheaper per unit than a linear fence planting. But on that property, what was the best option for improving connectivity for koalas? <coughs> Our tree spacing was typically one tree per two metres. In the longer term, larger spacings are better for eucalypt canopy development, which means more food for koalas. But in the shorter term, one tree per two metres is better for, better for canopy enclosure and reduce weed maintenance. Our species mix for each planting was primarily determined by a nearby reference community where, where one existed, but we were creating primary koala habitat. So the portion of uh, primary food trees comprised 40 to 60% of our, of our planting mix. Tree protection was always considered. If temporary or permanent fencing or tree guards were required, cost and practicality were the two um, factors impacting on our choice. 
And finally, the timing of, of planting. This was influenced mainly by meeting targets and contractor availability, but we did find that planting autumn to early winter or even early summer achieved good results. So while the project focused on the creation of koala habitat, it also involved habitat restoration. And so I'll touch on both topics. Regarding creating koala habitat, I will cover site preparation, planting and maintenance. So primarily for the project, bush regenerators were employed to undertake planting. But on public land in the Tweed, Team Koala and other community members undertook plantings. And in Byron, landholders, their friends and neighbours undertook social working bees to get their trees planted. So it really involved a lot of people. Reflecting the diverse range of sites, landholders and bush regenerators, many different methods were used for site preparation. So several herbicide-free properties in Byron successfully used solarisation to kill exotic grasses. Um, jo will talk a little bit more about this in her presentation. Uh, following slashing, black plastic sheets were laid for, laid for several weeks, killing grasses and providing a great mulch bed to plant in. At a property in Reserve Creek in the Tweed, a burn was undertaken as part of site preparation. The site was sprayed, then, burnt, then a hazard reduction burn carried out. It was fenced from cattle with then a follow-up spot spray, and this created a great easy site for planting. And another Byron landowner spread their entire planting site with wood chip mulch. The site became alive with fungi as the wood chip broke down, and this provided a great carbon-rich bed for planting. And Joe will also talk a little bit more about this site too. But for other sites, more standard methods were used, including weed spraying and woody weed control. Slashing or brush cutting was used to assist with access and augering holes. And for sites with stock, grazing was encouraged right up until the planting. The primary aim of site preparation was to minimise competition with weeds, maximise survivorship and growth of planted trees, and to encourage native species regeneration in the planting site. So the next stage, of course, the planting. So all trees were planted by hand using tube stock that was typically sourced from local nurseries grown from locally sourced seed. Mulch or, met, weed, mulch or weed mats were used and all plants were well watered in, but then most plantings were then reliant on rainfall. The standard tree guard we used for protection from browsing was a one metre high plastic mesh guard secured with two wooden stakes. To protect larger plantings from wallaby browse, for instance, the 500 stem, uh, 5,000 stem planting in Kujan Nature Reserve. Temporary fencing was installed and then has been removed once the trees were 12 months old. On properties with cattle or horses, standard, and st standard stock or permanent fencing, permanent, sorry, standard permanent stock or electric, electric fencing was used. So site maintenance, of course, was essential and had the similar aims as site prep. Control weeds to reduce competition. Encourage high survivorship and growth of planted trees. And encourage native regeneration into the planting side. Oops, At 12 months, the survivorship of planted trees ranged from 80 to 95% with a handful of sites falling outside this range, but averaging about 90% of all the sites combined. So while tree survivorship was high, we had a range of factors that resulted in tree losses or affected tree growth. These included uh, dry conditions, prolonged inundation, poor soils and frost, where you had myrtle rust affecting broadleaf paperbark trees, um, trees often, when they get to a certain point, die, and so we can only assume things like plant disease or insect attack. Damage from stock, browsing from wallabies, which more so affected properties in Byron, and hares, which we found quite a bit of um, problem with on the Tweed coast. Accidental slashing or herbicide spraying. Uh, sites affected by bushfire, vandalism, and sometimes species not quite suited to their conditions. Site observations um, more recently have indicated that survivorship decreases slightly at year two, 
but increases seen in native species regeneration and canopy cover of planted trees. So growth at year two, uh, growth of trees at year one range from about one to five metres. So this really reflects the varied con conditions across all sites and the species used. At year two, the growth in eucalypts in some sites has now reached about 10 metres. Uh, one buyer of property, which won our tallest tree competition, um, had the winning tree, which was reached eight metres in 18 months. Uh, our budget to plant a tree was $12, but our actual costs, which are still quite rubbery, we're still working on that, probably about $7 to $15 a tree. Um, and the, just the many site variables are the cost of this large variance, uh, sorry, are the cause of this large variance in cost. So variables which resulted in significant cost increases included site um, topography and access, the type of density of weeds at a site, whether it's grasses or your woody weeds, and the need to guard or fence a site. Restoration of koala habitat was also undertaken, typically by bush regenerators in remnant habitat next to plantings. Restoration works aim to reduce the potential for weeds to reinfest plantings, um, improve remnant koala habitat, and increase the potential for koala use of plantings. A good example, which I don't have an image of, sorry, um, was the removal of an area of invasive bamboo on a property at Tiagra, which resulted in koalas being able to access food trees they previously couldn't um, access. Uh, restoration also aimed to reduce the threats to koala habitat. For example, at some properties at Reserve Creek that had camphor laurel infecting tallow wood forest um, and drill injecting mature camphor laurel um, just to improve the, the habitat there. Another, another area was reduction of fuels that could, risk, could increase the risk of an unplanned fire. So, uh, for example, control of lantana grasses and vines at the pots for wetland. Cost was another factor, with funding focused predominantly on primary regeneration, with limited funds for follow-up. As with many restoration projects, there is a trade-off between opening up areas and creating a bigger weed problem if follow-up funds are limited. We did, the project did, however, um, enable some strategic investment in areas of primary koala habitat on the eastern side of the Pacific Highway. So for uh, examples of these are the Tiagra Crown Reserve in Byron, which is a nice area of forest red gum habitat, and also the Pottsville Wetland in Tweed. So one of our most exciting results of the project is having koalas starting to use plantings at a handful of sites. These include several plantings in the Pottsville wetland, one on private property next to the wetland, and plantings in Coogee Nature Reserve, Pottsville Crown Reserve and at Tanglewood. A common feature of all of these sites is that they are located next to koala habitat that is currently occupied by koalas and all are on the Tweed Coast. So koalas have been recorded on trees as young as 15 months old, but due to the limited leaf on trees and quantity of food needed by a koala, a 15 month old planting can't sustain a koala. Therefore, it's likely that the plantings are supplementing the diet of koalas using adjacent habitat. At Pottsville Wetland, koalas were browsing on plantings within six months of a large fire. The fire resulted in the temporary loss of, koala, of food for koalas with areas of swamp mahogany being burned. So possibly koalas turned to young planted trees for, following, uh, for foraging following that fire. The fact that koalas are already using plantings has been very exciting news for us. For our monitoring for the funding body, we usually measure things like uh, tree growth and survivorship. But now we're also monitoring our plantings to see if they're being used by koalas. Planted food trees are monitored for signs of browsing, and broken and bent branches from koala bottoms or reaching arms, <coughs> scats underneath trees and scratches on trunks, and if you're really lucky, a koala in a planted tree. So what about tree guarding? I certainly have reconsidered my approach to guarding planted trees from wallaby or, wallaby or hairbrows. 
For me, I reckon if the risk is low, forget the guard. Whilst essential at some sites, the guards we often use it did affect tree growth. They also added about $5 to the cost of supplying and maintaining a tree, so, sorry, supplying and planting a tree. They also need to be maintained, removed eventually, but they can be reused, and they do uh, add, the use of plastic and hardwood does add, add an environmental cost to planting a tree. On the Tweed Coast, when we started planting in 2012, Risk of wallaby grass was very high. At some sites, one metre high guards did not offer enough protection. Only three years later, risk of wallaby grass at these same sites was so low that, that guards weren't required. But in Byron, wallaby grass has once been one of their biggest issues. In some areas of the Tweed Coast, we now have to guard for hares, not wallabies. Um, Justin Malley will talk a little bit, a bit later uh, about eucalypt regeneration and fire. But I'd just like to share um, some of my observations regarding uh, weed control and eucalypts. Whilst weed control in koala, koala habitat certainly has been effective at reducing weed threat, we aren't seeing a lot of recruitment of, of koala feed trees following weed control. At most sites, recruitment after weed control is dominated by rainforest species, or species like brush fox, swamp box, borderleaf paperback and swamp oak, obviously dependent on the site. Recruitment of koala food trees has only been disturbed on the disturbed edges of bushland, and so perhaps other options to extend the, koala, uh, extend the life of koala habitat will be, need to be considered. Possibly infill planting koala food trees in disturbed gaps within habitat, or in introducing fire to encourage the natural regeneration of food trees. Whilst not every site has been a success, I believe a few key factors have resulted in the project overall being successful. Having a great extended team working towards a united goal, our bush regenerators, our local plant nurseries, landowners, community groups and volunteers, steering committee and project teams in Tweed and Byron. Good communication and building relationships with landowners, contractors and the community. It takes a lot of time, but it's enjoyable and rewarding and it does make a big difference. And whilst we maintained a standard approach, the methods we used at each site were tailored, reflecting the diversity of landholders and sites across the project area. I would like to end my presentation with a very big thank you to all the bush regenerators who have worked so hard on this project with me in the Tweed, the landholders who have opened up their properties to help koalas, and finally the committed community and team koala members who help me every month to plant koala food trees. Thank you.